well, hello, we're going to talk about the Roman Empire. So let me just pull up our PowerPoint here and we'll get started. When we think about the New Testament, particularly when we think about the Bible, um, we really can't think about the New Testament without thinking about the context of the Roman world, first century Rome. When I say that, I mean, of course, we have the capital city of Rome, but you have this massive, uh, almost feels like worldwide global empire that stretches from Spain and Great Britain all the way over to past what we would call kind of the, the Middle East today. This huge, um, diverse language is all over the place kind of land being run by one empire. So why this is so important to New Testament studies, because all the writers and the people that we'll talk about in scripture or in the New Testament, all living in the Roman Empire. So therefore the government shapes what's happening. And when we think about the Roman Empire, we think, let's kind of go backwards a little bit and think about 45 years before Jesus. And this is Julius Caesar, the most famous of the Roman emperors. And it's really Julius Caesar who typifies for us when we think of emperor, he is like the key essential emperor. Under his leadership, this charismatic figure, Rome shifts from more of a Senate format to a personality-driven emperor leading the empire. And with Caesar, you also start having people think that there's this whisperings of maybe this figure is a gift from the gods or, or one of the gods, right? Now, of course, we know Caesar is betrayed by his best friend. He's killed on March 15th of 44 uh, BCE, which is roughly, like I say, 45, 46 years before Jesus's life. Um, so we, don't, we won't read anything about Julius Caesar in the New Testament, but the shadow that he casts uh, as the emperor uh, begins to set the stage for when Jesus becomes an adult and when um, people like St. Paul are writing and ministering in the first century, the idea of the emperor looms large. So uh, now I, I took you back about 45 years, but let's go back even actually further than that. Let's go about 300 years before Jesus. And all I'm trying to do in this is to set the stage a little bit for the cultural social dynamics of how we interpret our lives. Now, so let's think about us, for example, for a second even though you might not be a very political person, we know that your life has been impacted by leaders like you know, President Obama, President Trump, President Biden, and no matter where you're at politically with those, they, those still cast a, a, a powerful influence on our daily lives. So think about the influence that Vladimir Putin is having in the world right now with the war in Ukraine. So let's go 300 years back to the time when the Greeks were running the world. And this is 323 BCE. And Alexander the Great is this charismatic, brilliant military leader who is ruling the Greek empire and has practically taken over the world. And his desire is to not only control the world, but to make the world Greek. This idea of pushing his culture as the supreme culture, this is the process known as Hellenization. You'll find here on this slide, Hellenization. And Hellenization is the process of um, influencing other cultures on behalf of Greek culture. So number one, think about the language. I want everyone to speak Greek. I want people to, um, uh, I want everyone to speak Greek. Number two, I want, um, I want everyone to participate in Greek sports, um, eat the foods that we eat, dress the way that we dress. I want people to have the worldview that we have. Now this plays out. So think about in our most recent history, um, think about the, 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 the notion of how, you know, 100 years ago or so when the British Empire was colonizing so many different places, the Brits would come into places like Kenya, uh, they would come into places like India and demand that a really civilized person would wear a three-piece suit, 
play cricket, speak English, drink tea, and here you are, it's in South India, and it might be 105 degrees outside. Why would a civilized person wear a three-piece suit and drink tea? But for the Brits, it was this notion of this is what really civilized people are. So the Greeks are in that same way, pushing their culture. And we'll find out this puts a ton of pressure on Jewish people around the world, particularly Jews who live in Israel. And Jews will try to keep up their own religious practices of Sabbath, dietary laws, um, circumcision, things that are really important to who they are, but in the midst of this social influence from the Greek um, Hellenization process. And what we're going to find out is that by the time we get to the first century, Greek influence will permeate the world to the point that the Greek language is the language spoken across the world. So think about the New Testament, right? What language was the New Testament written in? Well, it was written in Greek. But all things come to an end. So as Alexander was leading the day, about 10 years into his reign, uh, he dies and his empire splits up. But what we find out is that that rules the day for... Um, you know, 200 some years, by the time we get to about 165 years before Jesus's life, um, we, we get to 165 BCE. And this is the time of a Greek ruler. His name is Antiochus Epiphanes IV, Antiochus Epiphanes IV. And he is a Greek leader who controls the land where Israel is. So think of the modern day Middle East. And he is putting a ton of pressure on Jews to move past their Jewish religion and to become more, quote unquote, cultured, Hellenized, become more like the Greeks. So he builds gyms in Rome, or he builds gyms in Israel. And that's not a huge issue, we would think, except when you start knowing how uh, the Greeks played sports. Um, they would do them naked, right? And that was a shock to the socially conservative Jews. Um, this is a place where they would educate. Uh, Antiochus Epiphanes IV wanted to have sacrifices in the Jewish temple. And this is a huge, huge, huge no-no because one, non-Jews can't go into the temple. Number two, you have to be a Jewish priest to sacrifice. So these things would defile or shut down the temple. Also, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes IV uh, ultimately forbid or outlawed circumcision. So no longer could Jewish males be circumcised. He shut down religious sacrifices, Jewish religious sacrifices, and he made it illegal to read and study the Torah, the, the Old Testament. So talk about massive pressure and persecution now on the Jews to the point that finally the Jews have enough. They can't handle this anymore, that some Jewish um, leaders revolt and they do it through guerrilla warfare. And the most famous of the revolutionaries is a man by the name of Judas the Maccabees. And there was a priest who leads the way, and then Judas the Maccabees leads in the military. And they will actually, through a surprising turn of events, will throw out the Greeks. Now, they're not, the, the Jews are not trying to like take over more land than what they believe is theirs. They're simply trying to take Israel back over for, uh, for the Jewish teachings. Um, they don't care about anything else, but they're just trying to get this pagan, non-Jewish influence out of Israel. And surprisingly, shockingly, they win the day. So this story of what's called the Maccabean Revolt or the Maccabean Rebellion uh, is told in a couple books called First Maccabees and Second Maccabees. You can read them in a Jewish Bible if you open up a Jewish Old Testament. You'll see First and Second Maccabees there, um, or if you open up a Bible that has what's called the Apocrypha, the hidden books in between the Old and New Testament, um, you'll see them there. And it tells a story. Now, why why do you care about any of this, right? Well, the reason why this is so important is because a figure like Judas the Maccabees, one who is a great religiously minded and military minded leader, when he kicks out the Greeks. This is only about 160 years before uh, Jesus is born, and what happens is this sets the stage for expectation of what a leader would be like. So when Jesus hits, comes along and he's the Messiah, 
The question is, will you be a military messiah? <clears throat> will you expel our foreign occupiers, the Romans of the first century? This puts a ton of pressure on Jesus and becomes a key part of the expectations of the first century of Jewish persons who are living in Israel. So here's a picture of, on the left here, you'll see Judas the Maccabees. And of course, that menorah in the middle, um, the festival of Hanukkah starts uh, during the, the, the Maccabean rebellion because as the Greeks are kicked out, uh, the temple is defiled and there's particular oil that must be used to light the fires and the candles in the temple and there was only enough oil for one day well during this miracle of the lights the festival of the lights um there somehow supernaturally becomes enough oil for eight days until they can get enough oil um created to keep going and keep the temple lights on and this miracle during the maccabean rebellion is what's called hanukkah or the festival of lights so for about a hundred years, the Jewish Maccabean dynasty or the Hasmonean dynasty leads the way, but something is changing around the globe. No longer are the Greeks the big dogs of the world. Now the Romans, the Roman Empire is gathering up and gaining huge momentum around the world, and Rome pretty much has Israel surrounded. So, of course, it's no surprise that Israel will fall. Israel-Palestine will fall and uh, is annexed by the Roman Empire, and Rome will then install their own Roman leaders in Israel. What's happening around this moment? Well, it turns out in the Roman Empire, something massive is happening. There's an emperor change. Julius Caesar is assassinated which leads to a huge power vacuum and there's a civil war in the Roman Empire and on one side is Mark Anthony and the Egyptian Cleopatra and they're fighting versus um, Octavian or another name for Octavian is a young man by the name of Augustus and they battle it out and of course the winner is uh, Octavian or Augustus. This young man will rule Rome, rule the Roman Empire and people in the empire begin to call him the Prince of Peace. They call him the Lord of Lords. They call him their savior. There's even stories created that somehow when he was born, angels filled the sky and said, now to us today has been born the savior of the world, the one who's going to usher in this peace. And the, the sharing of this message was, known as the good news or the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom of Octavian or Augustus. Now, why do I say that? Because if you know anything about the New Testament, you know that some of the stories I just shared are exactly the way the New Testament writers talk about Jesus's birth. Angels filled the sky declaring him the king of kings, declaring him the savior of the world, sharing this good news, the one who was ushered in peace. So some people believe that the early Christian writers were borrowing from these Roman stories and switching the, the, the idea that it's not Octavian, but it's Jesus who is the savior of the world, which gives us a really interesting thing to think about, right? How much do the stories around us impact how we tell the, our own stories of importance? Well, one of the things that becomes important is, as Rome now has direct influence on Israel, the Jewish leaders have been expelled, now Rome's going to put their own leaders in, how will Rome um, deal with this Jewish land? And here's how Rome will do it. They will install a Jewish leader who is pro-Rome, and the person they select is a guy by the name of Herod. Historically, he's called Herod the Great, and he's actually a horrible, horrible human being because he is by birth Jewish, and he knows the Jewish uh, festivals and practices, but he's not, not religious in his heart. He's more pro-Rome, wants to climb the ladder. He wants to be seen as um, a great leader. Uh, and what he does is he begins a massive expansion of the Jewish temple. 
So here we are. And you think, oh my gosh, this is, this is wonderful. This is exactly what you think the Jewish people would want. They would want uh, their temple to be made even greater, and they would um, see this person as extremely wonderful, and you think, how could this be wrong? Except when you realize that he is simply, Herod the Great is simply expanding the temple and, and, and pouring money into the temple, because he really wants to be known as the great builder. He wants the Jewish people to be loyal to him. He's trying to buy their favor, even though he's a horrible human being. And for some people, it works. He rules for almost 40 years. Um, but let's talk about how, why he's so bloodthirsty. Well, when, when Herod wins the day and he becomes the, the leader of Israel under Roman appointment, uh, the first thing he does, he kills off the line uh, remember those people who led the Maccabean Rebellion, the Hasmoneans? He kills off anyone connected to that line. Also, he will build a new city called Caesarea, which he will dedicate to the Roman emperor. He marries 10 women, and he, he kills some of his wives and some of his sons because he doesn't think they're loyal, and he becomes jealous of their popularity. Um, he's also one, I don't know if you know this story or not, but after Jesus was born, there's a story where some wise men, star astrologers, they come from the east, they come to Jerusalem, they meet with, with Herod the Great, and they say, you know, it's been revealed to us that a king in Israel has been born. And Herod says, well, that's fascinating. I didn't know there was another king, right? And of course, he says that because he's so jealous and he's thinking in his heart, there's no king but me. And he says, oh, you know, wise people, please tell me where this king has been born so I too can go and worship him. Well, as the wise men leave and they're following the star, it's been revealed to them that this is, this is a terrible thing that now Herod knows. And they must not return. They must not tell Herod what's going on. But either way, Herod finds out. And he finds out that the Christ child has been born. And he, he sends his troops into this town. And when he sends his troops into the town, he's looking for baby Jesus. But, but at this point, Jesus is probably over one year old. But either way, um, Jesus, in the middle of the night, his parents, his father had been warned in a dream by an angel to get up in the middle of the night, to quickly gather their things, and to head out of town. Not just out of town, out of the country. They literally flee as a refugee in the middle of the night from Israel to Egypt. Thank God there was no border wall in Egypt or Jesus would have been dead. His family barely escapes, but the soldiers who come into the town kill every male child two years and under. I want you to think about that for a second. Imagine the leader who orders the slaughtering of toddlers because he's so jealous. This is Herod the Great. His rule is defined by jealousy, anger, domination, extreme cruelty. And why do I tell you any of this? Well, this is the leader that is leading Israel under Roman rule by the time that Jesus is born. And it shows us the direct contrast of what this poor Jewish child later turned teacher, Jesus, the alternative he would bring to Roman power. So here's a picture of the Roman Empire stretching on your right all the way over to, you know, past the Middle East and on your left. Uh, to Spain and Great Britain, right? This massive empire, including North Africa, all of Europe. Now, a couple of things that I want to highlight as we get ready to finish is this idea of how does the culture that we live in impact how we understand God and or living a life dealing with God? So, in the ancient world, in the Greco-Roman culture and society that we are uh, reading about in the New Testament, we realize that there are no social safety nets. What I mean by that, like today, we have structures in place in our country to take care of the poor and the least. So, for example, if I get hurt at work and I can't work, we have something called disability <clears throat> insurance that I will get paid to... <clears throat> excuse me, to, to live, to survive um, through disability. Uh, maybe I'm a young mother and I'm having a hard time paying for formula. There's a program called WIC. Um, if I'm struggling with food security, there are, there's called food stamps or a um, EBT card, right? 
uh, maybe I'm struggling with insurance so I can get like Medicaid health insurance. If I'm older, Medicare, Social Security. Um, even for us who are going to college, there are Pell Grants. There are all these different ways for people to be supported from the government if you come on hard times. In the ancient world, there wasn't, the government did not provide for you like that. So if you were on to hard times or had some kind of devastating, you know, natural disaster, et cetera, a lot of times you just died or suffered intensely. So there was a uh, social protocol in first century Rome that would step in. It was called the patron-client relationship. So let me talk about that real quick. A patron is a wealthy person of Rome who had influence. So let's think, let's think about the town of Prestonsburg. There are some wealthy people in Prestonsburg, and these people um, have some influence in the town. So if I were a wealthy person in Prestonsburg and you were a poor person, I may offer to help you, provide for you. Maybe I give you some money so your kid can go to school, or maybe I give you some seeds to, to replant your field, or maybe I, you know, rent out to you a tractor to use, or, you know, something like this. Now, why would I do that? I'm doing that for two reasons. Number one, I want to gain your loyalty. And why do I want to gain your loyalty? Well, because I want to gain further influence in my city, and maybe I want to become governor, or I want to become county commissioner. Now, in Rome, there are no elections. How do you do this? You do this through social influence and through war. So I'm going to, let's say I, as this wealthy person, I'm going to expel the current governor because I want to be the governor, and I'm going to have to do that through the sword. Now, am I going to send my children to the front lines to fight? Absolutely not. I'm going to send the people who are loyal to me. I have this group of people that I have gained loyalty with, and they're going to fight for me. So um, I may provide for these poor people through my social influence. I might provide for them for some resources. They're going to give me loyalty. And this is the most important of Roman virtues, loyalty. It is the number one thing that people value in Roman society. Now, in 21st century America or the United States, we don't, I mean, loyalty is fine, but it's like not our number one virtue. As, as you and I both know, I mean, uh, you know, relationships break up all the time. 50% of marriages break up. Um, you might see the football coach who coaches um, this one season, and then the, the next season he's signed a contract with the rival, right? There's no idea of like, you have to stay loyal with the same company or the same people your whole life. That's not as value in the United States. The chief value of the United States is individual freedom and liberty. I can wear a mask or not. I can own a gun if I want or not. I'm going to do whatever I want because it's my life. That's the number one virtue of the United States. But in ancient Rome in the first century, loyalty was number one. Now, why does that matter at all? Well, let's talk about how that impacts how people would see God and deal with God. Many of you probably have heard of a prayer called the Lord's Prayer. It's found in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And in this prayer, Jesus uh, was um, encountered by his disciples, and they said, Teacher, would, would you teach us how to pray? And Jesus said, When you pray, pray like this. He says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, it's interesting, that line, our father, another way to say that is our patron, right? the one who provides for us. So let's listen to that prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. So here you have the ultimate patron, and now the client is asking for things like daily bread. So provide for us. Oh, great patron, provide for us. Now, in that exchange, what is asked of God, right? Provide for us. But what then does the client, the person asking, what are they going to give back? They give their, their loyalty. I will follow you wherever you go. I will do what you ask me to do. I am yours, right? I surrender to you. You are my leader. Do you see how the patron-client relationship um, in ancient Rome impacts how people shape their spirituality, 
I think it's a fascinating experience to see it in throughout the New Testament. Now, um, another thing we need to talk about is the role of slavery in Rome. Now, when I say the word slavery, there are lots of images that come to your mind. Preeminently, the form of slavery that was happening in the United States via the transatlantic slave trade of the 16, 17, and 1800s. Now, a couple things. Slavery is a horrific sin. Slavery is a sin that, sadly, the United States has founded upon. The United States has built itself on the back of slaves. Literally today, we think that there are roughly 2 million African slaves tossed over and died in the Atlantic Ocean because of the transatlantic slave trade. The slavery in the United States was based on skin color or racial slavery. It was also based on what's called chattel slavery. So a person was kidnapped, taken from Africa, sold on a slave block, split from their families, horribly treated, and then when they had children, that child was automatically born into slavery and would stay perpetually a slave. This horrific life, a life filled with physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional traumatic abuse, was classic American chattel slavery. Slavery on every end was wrong. First century Roman slavery was a little different, and let me tell you how. Number one, it was not based on kind of race or skin color. That's a slavery that was literally, racism in itself was literally created in the 15 and 1600s to, um, to make profit off of people. You have to create a whole worldview um, to say these people are now lesser than us so that I can then take advantage of them and sell them and brutalize them. But in the ancient world, that was not the case. Slavery was from two reasons. One, I was, I'm so poor, I sold myself into slavery to gain money so I could get out of it. Or slavery happened because my village takes over your village and we enslave you. Um, in the United States, in the, for example, 1800s, slaves did two things usually. They were either field hands, working in the field, picking cotton, such things, or working in the home, cleaning the home taking care of you know, the, the white child, right? But in the ancient world, slaves could be used in all forms of Roman society, from being doctors and teachers to, of course, you know, cleaning the sewers, etc. But slaves were involved in all things. Now, you can't understand first century Rome without understanding slaves because one fourth, one out of four people in the Roman Empire were slaves. Now, slavery could be generational, but slaves could get married. Uh, of course, slaves were sold as uh, an investment publicly. And they were, of course, people were, of course, seen as property. But violence against slaves in the first century wasn't as socially okay or appropriate as it was in the 16, 17, 1800s in the United States. So for example, if I were in South Carolina in 1805, and on a Sunday afternoon, I took a slave out to the field, tied him to a post, and beat the living daylights out of him because I thought he said something inappropriate or whatever, I could then go back to my church or go back to my club and drink tea and laugh about it and be high five by my people. First century Rome, that was not okay. Violence happened, but it wasn't celebrated. It wasn't because this would be the same thing as if you had like a, like a tractor that you took out in the field and just beat on it for no reason. That would not seem right because slaves were seen as investments. Now, why do you care about any of this? Number one, because we have to deal with the actual context of the scriptures, slavery. Slavery is addressed in the Bible, but also, um, one of the things that's the great sore spots, the pain spots of reading the New Testament is, you know, at times it feels like it's very misogynistic or it feels like it definitely puts women under men. There are some moments when we have to really wrestle with that, but also the issue of dealing with slavery in the Bible. And I want to highlight one point that I think is fascinating is that in, in Roman society, 
you weren't supposed to be violent to your slave, but you also were not supposed to be kind. Kindness to your slave was seen as like an ultimate weakness. Let's catch what one of the New Testament writers does. The New Testament letter known as Philippians, it's not Philippines, but Philippians, written by a guy by the name of Paul. He's writing to the church that happens to be meeting in the city of Philippi, hence the Philippians. And there's an argument going on in the church, and he is encouraging them to think and act like Jesus. So here's what he says. Rather in humility, this is Philippians chapter 2, Philippians 2. Uh, chapter or chapter two, verses three and following. I'll start from the beginning of chapter three, or I'll start from the beginning of chapter two, verse three. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So here he's saying, he's like, here's now how Jesus thinks and acts. Verse six, who being in the very form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a slave. Now, this is so powerful because what Paul is arguing is that Jesus, who was equal with God, didn't hold on to that, but he he left that, turned that, you know, surrendered that and became human. So God takes on flesh and becomes human and not only becoming human, but taking the very role of a slave, taking the very role of a servant. And in this, here's why this is so important, because God becomes a slave. God becomes a servant. Now, that very nature, that idea challenges the foundations of slavery. If I am a Christian who's holding as a slave, I now have to ask myself the question, could, should I be enslaving somebody? Should I hold them captive if my God has identified with them? How can I believe that I'm greater than anybody and hold on to somebody like that? So what happens is it shows that God takes on the full experience of weakness and pain to become a slave, but also it begins to lay the foundations, the, the theoretical foundations of that which is going to destroy the institution of slavery. Um, we find out that during the time of Augustus or Octavian, Rome has a, a time of great peace, and this helps Christians and Christianity begin to flourish because um, the message of Christ can be circulated around the world. It's not filled with bloodshed all the time. Um, here's an image of a Roman soldier. And this image, which has been very frequent and, and seen all over the Roman Empire, will be used by New Testament writers, particularly St. Paul. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 6, he uses a spiritual reality when it comes to the, the soldiers. He says, you know, put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, um, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, shoes um, equipped with the gospel of peace. This is a powerful way to take what people are seeing every day and include it in um, spiritual address. One last thing I want to talk about was the military. Rome had a professional military. It's the first of its kind. Professionally trained soldiers who um, would be, uh, no wonder they were a world empire, right? They would have been highly trained, professional, and um, and led by generals or people who are known as centurions. And centurions, we will find out, are mentioned in the New Testament. There are a couple of times where a centurion will come to Jesus and ask for his servant to be healed. And this should cause us to pause because the centurion is, as like I said, like a general, a person that's very important in Roman military. And we would have to ask ourselves, why is it that a very important Roman military leader would come to Jesus who is this, you know, for lack of better terms, he's kind of like this uh, hillbilly preacher who has no um, 
riches, no social clout, no status. And there's this powerful moment that causes it to pause and say, what's going on socially that this centurion is willing to publicly go to Jesus? Um, that shows us the countercultural nature, but also the way that Jesus is having this electrifying drawing power to bring people, but also it shows you the profound depths of desperation when the centurion is coming to Jesus. Now, we know that you read earlier about the different gods of and the different religious expressions in the Roman Empire that were happening in the first century. Um, there's just one that I wanted to highlight, and um, this one is known as Mithras. Mithras was a god figure of the first century that was worshipped. There was a religion around Mithras, and there's multiple stories about Mithras. Some people say he was born of a cosmic egg. Others say he was born of a virgin. And this godlike figure, born of a virgin, will ultimately do battle with a cosmic bull, a cosmic bull that runs through the universe, bringing death and destruction and difficulty. And finally, Mithras will encounter this cosmic bull in a great cosmic fight in a cave, and the bull will dramatically wound Mithras. Some people saying that Mithras was wounded, died, and raised again. Um, but in this, through this experience, Mithras kills the cosmic bull to never rise again. And this figure, Mithras, defeats evil, sin, and death. Now, I don't know about you, but let's step back and ask this question. A godlike figure, born of a virgin, who does battle with sin, evil, and death, defeating them, wounded, and raised again. Who does that sound like? Interestingly enough, Mithras' followers um, would gather, and they would partake in a meal where they would drink wine and eat bread. A godlike figure born of a virgin, defeating sin, death, and evil, wounded, raised again, whose followers celebrate by drinking wine and eating bread. Some people think that maybe the story of Jesus is an adaptation from the story of Mithras. Now, I, on the other hand, see it quite differently. I see it as the fact that there are some common themes arising in first century Roman Empire that the early Christians identify with, but not that they're borrowing from a story. This is their own story, Jesus' own path. But rather than when Christians proclaim this message, it's not as foreign or as unthinkable as we would think. There were others talking about these very similar type experiences. So without saying any further, um, this is our uh, lecture today. Here's another ancient uh, discovery of where Mithras worshipers would gather. So without saying that, um, there you go. We are now uh, done with our, our lecture on uh, first century Rome.